The Pacific Northwest is one of the most beautiful, luscious, mountainous areas of the United States. Consisting of a thousand mile stretch of Pacific coastline from Northern California into British Columbia, the area as a whole is the rainiest region in the United States, excluding the islands of Hawaii. It receives over a hundred inches of rainfall a year, with smaller regions closer to the coast receiving over 150 inches. The long rainy season, which extends from October through late spring, can bring long bouts of gloomy, low stratus clouds that hug the mountain peaks, shrouding the incredible landscape from view. And while rain and fog are all too common, severe thunderstorms are actually pretty rare, and tornadoes are almost non-existent. But on a fateful day in 1972, a violent tornado struck Vancouver, Washington, a mere eight miles from downtown Portland, tearing through the city, killing seven. In fact, three other tornadoes also touched down on that day, all in the Pacific Northwest. Today, we're going to look at how these tornadoes could have possibly occurred, the stars that had to align, and the effects that they had on the Portland area for years to come. To start, let's take a look at the ingredients for a tornado that inherently exist in the Pacific Northwest. One is moisture. That's a given, and here's why it rains most of the year. Off the coast of Alaska exists a low pressure system called the Aleutian Low. It sits over an area of colder water near the Aleutian Islands, strengthening in the winter and nearly vanishing in the summer. To the southeast of the Aleutian Low is the North Pacific High, over an area of warmer water. The position of these two air masses influences the path of the jet stream. In the summer, the jet stream lifts to the north, flowing over central British Columbia. This brings drier, sunnier weather to the entirety of the Pacific Northwest in the summer, which is why that's the peak of tourism season. But in the fall and the winter, the Aleutian Low starts to strengthen, and the Pacific High shifts southward, causing the jet stream to shift to the south. This is when the temperatures fall and the rainy weather begins. Okay, so the jet stream moves south, which brings in colder air. But why is it rainier? Is there always rain to the north of the jet stream? Well, no, but cyclones that develop near the strong Aleutian Low follow the path of the jet stream to the east, striking anywhere along the Pacific Northwest coast from Oregon up through western Alaska, depending on the time of year and position of the jet stream. Now, these cyclones look a lot like hurricanes, and one might think to call them that. While, yes, a big factor in the classification of a hurricane is that the sustained wind speed has to be greater than 74 miles an hour, there are also other important criteria. Hurricanes are tropical, and North Pacific cyclones are extra tropical. Tropical cyclones form in the tropics, or between 23.5 degrees south and 23.5 degrees north latitude. They start off as clusters of thunderstorms over the intertropical convergence zone, an area where the trade winds of the northern and southern hemisphere meet. The cluster of thunderstorms is fueled by the warm water and begins to slowly rotate, intensifying into a tropical depression and eventually a tropical storm. There's a big word used to describe the environment that the tropical cyclone is in, barotropic. This essentially means that there are no fronts. There's no cold front, no warm front, the temperature across each layer of the atmosphere is uniform. It makes sense because often the day after a hurricane makes landfall in the southeastern US, it's still hot and humid. There's no real cold front to bring relief after the cyclone passes. That is a tropical cyclone. An extra tropical cyclone is the opposite. They form over water or land outside of the tropics along temperature gradients or baroclinic zones. A disturbance in an upper level Rossby wave flows over top of a temperature gradient, an area where temperatures change with distance. This disturbance above creates an area of divergence or air flowing away from a point, giving that point lower pressure. The air directly below at the surface is now able to rise to fill the low pressure void aloft, which then creates low pressure at the surface. Then the Coriolis force causes the fronts to rotate, and the rest is history. A cyclone is born. But because these extratropical cyclones are so far north and over water, two things make them dangerous. One, being that far north allows the Coriolis force to have a greater impact on the development of the cyclone. In most mid-latitude cyclones, the cold front on the southwestern side eventually catches up to the warm front, creating an occlusion. The occluded front is then pulled to the north by the Coriolis force, giving the low that swirl-like feature when viewed on satellite. However, the northern Pacific cyclones are near 50 degrees latitude, where the Coriolis force is much stronger, so the occluded front can wrap tightly around the low center, creating these giant ferocious swirling bands of rain and wind. The second thing that makes these extratropical cyclones more dangerous than land-based mid-latitude cyclones is that they are over water. 
and water has a much lower surface roughness than land, allowing for higher wind speeds when these cyclones eventually strike the coast. These associated windstorms from these extratropical cyclones have happened many times in the Pacific Northwest, like on Inauguration Day 1993. Now, granted, they aren't as intense as hurricanes, but can still pack quite the punch. Because this video is about tornadoes, we have to answer this question. Since all the rain and storms that impact the Pacific Northwest develop from systems over the Pacific Ocean, can cyclones over water in general produce tornadoes? Yes, they can across the board. And if you're familiar with tornadoes, you probably know that they need wind shear, which is the change in wind speed and direction with height. But if tropical cyclones exist in barotropic atmospheres where the temperature is uniform at each level, then there's no wind shear. There's no changing in the wind direction with height. So how can tropical cyclones produce tornadoes? Well, when the outer bands of hurricanes move ashore, the wind at the surface gets slowed down by land and vegetation, while the wind aloft maintains its speed. This creates the wind shear needed for tornadoes, and it's why the risk for tropical tornadoes increases a few hours after hurricane landfall. On the other hand, extratropical cyclones are more than capable of producing tornadoes. They ride the flow of the jet stream, which contains blazing fast winds thousands of miles above the surface of the Earth, so there is inherently plenty of wind shear for rotating thunderstorms. But the other ingredients for tornadoes are a bit harder to come by in the Pacific Northwest, and those are instability and lift. When a cyclone is over land, say in the Great Plains in April, for example, the area of greatest instability and lift is located to the south of the warm front and to the east of the cold front. This area is the warm sector. It contains moisture and warmth that is trapped low to the ground and gets lifted upwards as the cold front and drier air approach, causing explosive rotating thunderstorms. But the Pacific Northwest has several several inherent features that prevent these explosive storms. One, there's no massive source of warmth and moisture. The ocean waters off the coast of Northern California don't supply a low-level jet of warmth to the Pacific Northwest that can fuel thunderstorms like the Gulf of Mexico does. Two, the ideal area in which tornadoes can form is this 40,000 square mile strip along the coast. Any further east and you run into the Cascades where elevation can be an issue. The Willamette Valley is the most favorable spot for tornadoes because of southerly air convergence in the valley which can enhance rotation, but the valley is even smaller at only 25 miles wide. Third, when it is actually warm in the Pacific Northwest, the jet stream has already lifted hundreds of miles to the north. So not only are the wind shear and vorticity gone, but the powerful Aleutian low has weakened, and no cyclones are striking the Pacific Northwest. Great for tourism, but horrible for tornadoes. So somewhere in time exists a Goldilocks zone, where a weaker extratropical cyclone that isn't completely occluded can move ashore beneath the jet stream, offering plenty of wind shear for rotation, injecting warmer air into the area behind the warm front, with the cold front providing just enough lift and instability that tornadoes can form. This is what happened on April 5th, 1972. On April 3rd, a closed low was sitting off the coast of Northern California, very slowly progressing to the east. Just to the north, an extratropical cyclone sat off the coast of Washington, slowly progressing eastward as well. By the early morning of April 5th, the powerful jet stream had pulled the cyclone to the east, pushing the warm front through Western Oregon, lifting to the north. The associated cold front was located just off the coast and moving quickly to the east. Dew points in the warm sector were modest in the mid 40s, so there was some moisture, but that only offered marginal instability and was not enough for violent discrete storms. Surface winds were out of the south at around 15 knots, but winds aloft were streaking across the state from the south southwest at 70 knots. This provided ample wind shear, but once again, the numbers weren't insane. The storm mode of the day would likely involve some sort of QLCS that would form ahead of the cold front, making quick spin-up tornadoes possible, but the main threat would be damaging straight-line winds. Throughout the morning, a hundred or so miles ahead of the cold front, showers and thunderstorms made their way northeast across northern Oregon and southern Washington. A squall line developed along the cold front, and by 12.30, it blasted the Willamette Valley. Now, as this cold front was approaching, the wind field at the surface was greatly impacted by the topography of the area. Southerly winds were traveling along the low-lying Willamette Valley, but there were also winds flowing over the foothills of the Cascades, funneling into the Columbia River Gorge and blowing out of the east into the Portland Metro. We have seen how topography can cause surface wind convergence and enhance rotation in thunderstorms before. If you watched my video on May 31st, 1998, 
You remember that an embedded storm within a squall line produced an F3 tornado in Mechanicville, New York, as the surrounding mountains and valleys caused surface winds to converge from the south and east. And as the northern storm in the squall line passed over the Portland metro, it dropped a small tornado atop the marina to the west of the Portland International Airport. Crossing the water, the tornado lacked a solid condensation funnel, making it difficult to see. As it hit land to the north side of the river in Vancouver, Washington, it climbed the 300-foot hill and entered the Evergreen Highlands neighborhood. To the north on Kansas Street, the tornado caused total destruction of several one-story homes. Many residents interviewed in this area talked of the strong low-level wind field associated with the tornado, but were unable to see a condensation funnel upon approach. Did you see a cloud? No, no, just wind. Just terrible, terrible wind, no cloud. It was dark, it got very dark, but it, uh, there was no wind, I mean no, uh, no cloud. A few hundred feet to the north, it blew down several electric transmission towers, creating a shower of blue sparks that could be seen a mile away. This is when residents downwind first suspected that there was a tornado. To the northeast on 65th Avenue, students in Peter S. Ogden Elementary School were in recess when the storm gust front came through. They then went inside and prepared to attend a spelling bee in the gymnasium. With some students already in the gym, the tornado ripped off the roof, causing those students to run into the halls to seek shelter. This ultimately saved their lives as the walls of the gymnasium completely collapsed. 70 children were injured, but miraculously, all of them survived. Immediately after, football players from the Fort Vancouver football team located just to the west came running down the street to help the kids. Continuing northeast, the tornado hit the intersection of Northeast 4th Plain and North Anderson Roads, ripping the roof off of the Sunrise Lanes bowling alley. Sharon Gracer was working in the nursery at the time and survived the initial tornado. However, after rescuing several children inside the damaged building, the roof collapsed and it ultimately took her life. The tragedy continued across the street where a tornado tore through a Wearmart grocery store, killing five others, including three children. Continuing northeast, the tornado crossed Highway 500 and then Interstate 205, causing scattered damage to homes along the way. The tornado continued another five miles to the northeast before lifting, but produced significantly less damage during that time. In total, it killed six, injured 300, and caused $25 million in damage. Shortly after the incident, the National Guard was sent into Vancouver to help with search and rescue efforts. There were also three other tornadoes that day, two very short-lived F2s near Kettle Falls and Heartline, and another F3 way to the east in Creston. But none of them were deadly and caused sparse damage to farms. Arms. This tornado outbreak as a whole was the deadliest and most significant to ever impact the Pacific Northwest, and as you saw here, many meteorological factors had to align in order for this to occur. But it did, and that's the important part. Since then, the area has seen many more weak tornadoes. In 2021, an EF-0 touched down near Battleground, Washington, and in 2016, a damaging EF-2 hit Manzanita, Oregon. The main issue with the Vancouver tornado was there was no warning because it was 1972 and the radars at the time didn't have a velocity product. So hopefully today, if an EF-2 were to approach the suburbs of Portland, people would be notified, be smart, and seek shelter. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, you might be happy to learn that I am now on TikTok. And I'm not going to be pulling content from past videos and throwing them up on TikTok. I'm creating brand new short form content, a lot of very interesting weather stories and phenomena that can't really be stretched into 10, 20, 30 minute videos, but are still really cool and really deserve to be shared. So if you want to follow me there, the link is in the description. If not, if you despise TikTok, no worries. I understand this is not going to impact my YouTube schedule at all. I will still be here. Hope you guys have a great week and I will see you soon.